basic mechanism of injury with our trauma patients. Um, right here, we're just trying to figure out what trauma priority they need to be. And so this is a very short list. Um, this list is miles long, but these are just some basic ideas of what can upgrade or downgrade a trauma. Um, so the speed at which they're moving um, has to do with you know how bad the uh, how fast they were going before they had an impact and so then obviously higher speed causes more injuries so greater than 45 miles an hour if they fell two and a half times their height so two and a half times time two and a half times the height of the actual patient and then depending on how much intrusion is on the outside of the car so how far in the car got crunched or vehicle or whatever if you have a death of someone in the same compartment as you, you have you are a trauma patient. It doesn't matter if you're talking, walking, breathing, totally fine. You need a trauma workup to make sure that you don't have any injuries. Because if that person died in the car and you were in the same car with them, obviously there was a significant enough uh, mechanism that it killed one person. So uh, the mind reels with what it could have done to everybody else. Okay. Um, so we want uh, to worry about prolonged extrication, and this is, you know, on scene, of course, but you are going to want to know how long it took them to get them out of the car, if that was an issue. Um, and then patient status, um, so if they lost consciousness um, on scene, so that means they had a positive loss of consciousness. If they have a change in their level of consciousness, so they were walking, talking fine, and then now all of a sudden they're acting goofy. Um, not acting themselves and they're having a change in level of consciousness so that is a problem and then also if they have a central injury to their chest abdomen or pelvis or if they have a long bone fracture so mostly femurs but also uh, humerus as well okay now our primary trauma survey so that's a b c d e okay so this is actually pretty okay so this is actually um, pretty uh, important, okay? The only thing we're trying to do is we're trying to rule out life or limb threats. We're trying to identify them, fix them, or at the very least rule them out. Um, everyone, is, everyone has every injury possible or imaginable until otherwise proven by evidence of um, you know, imaging and our exam, all right? So our primary, tra primary trauma survey comes from TNCC, which is the trauma nurse core course, okay, that you have to take in order to be an ER nurse, all right? It's a two-day course. It's really great, and they teach you how to do this. So airway is the first thing. We want to make sure of, can they speak? Are they able to make words? Can they talk to you? Good. If they can, that is the best assessment that their airway is doing great for now, right? <laughs> only for now right lots and lots of stars and aster asterisks around that guy it does not mean that in an hour their airway will be clear but for right now you can move on okay um, if they cannot speak are they gurgling uh, is there something in their airway that's obstructing your ability their ability to speak so we section them right um, you can dink around with an NP or an OP airway as a general rule NP airways are not are contraindicated for any sort of head or face trauma okay those are the ones that go in the nose the nasal pharyngeal airways um, if they have an OP airway that's fine um, most of the time when they get to the ER and there's airway compromise we just preemptively intubate if they're unconscious then and the GCS is less than eight then we intubate so GCS less than eight you must intubate okay we're going to look in their mouth really, really quick, five seconds or less. We want to look for swelling, foreign bodies, and blood. Suction, remove as needed. Then we're going to check their C-spine. Wah, but we just want to make sure it's immobile. What does this have to do with airway? This is C-spine. It needs to be an airway for this reason. So if we have a C-spine injury in three to five or higher, right, then it will impair their ability to breathe, okay? So there's a little rhyme to remember that. C3, 4, or 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So if we have an injury there, ew, that's a problem, okay? And then you can look for tracheal deviation as well, and that requires that you put you know, one finger on either side of their trachea to make sure it's nice and straight. Right there, we're trying to rule out attention pneumo, okay? Then we're gonna um, move on down, hold on. We want to first auscultate. 
Okay, so you're going to auscultate two places, one side each place. Um, so uh, one side, so left side and right side. Okay, one place each side. This is not a detailed lung assessment. Okay, this is not a detailed auscultation. We're just trying to hurry quick and get in five seconds or less. Do they have breath sounds on both sides? Are they equal? Because there again, we need to intervene if they don't, right? Okay, now we're going to look at their overall effort or their work of breathing. That's what WOB stands for. You can put your hands on their chest at the same time to make sure that their chest is rising equally. Add oxygen and intervene appropriately, okay? So we might need to do tubes. We might need a needle decompressive if they've got a tension pneumo. We might need to put in a chest tube, okay? So now, generally speaking, in a normal, otherwise healthy adult with no major comorbidities, right? So they don't have uh, COPD, they don't have um, CHF or anything that's going to compromise their oxygenation ability. Um, you want to keep their SATs above 94 or 95, okay? Because any normal adult should be at least 94 or 95 on their SATs, okay? Um, so yeah, you know, apply oxygen as needed to keep their SATs you know, in the 94 or 95 range. Okay, so now we worry about circulation. So we've done airway, we've done breathing, we've intervened appropriately for both of those things, and then we're gonna check our pulses for circulation. So first thing, you're gonna check your carotids, check your femorals, check your radials, and then check your pedals. Um, so carotid, in order to have a really good, strong carotid pulse, you know that their systolic has to be at least 60 or 70. If they've got a really strong femoral pulse, you know their systolic has to be at least 70 or 80. If they have a really strong radial, you know they have to be at least 80 to 90. If they've got a really strong pedal, they have to be at least 90 to 100 to make it really strong, okay? All right, now we're gonna check our cap refill in all four extremities, so in our hands and our feet. Then check the color of their skin, the overall color, the temperature. We're looking to control any obvious bleeding. Don't get distracted by the shiny object of weird, crazy injuries. Um, if they're bleeding, great. Um, delegate that and have someone control the bleeding while you continue your trauma assessment. Now we're gonna intervene for their circulation. So we've intervened for breathing and airway, but now we wanna intervene for circulation. So we're gonna put in an IV, make sure that it's two large bore, so 18 gauge or better. Um, we need to locate an IV site within 60 to 90 seconds. If you're unable to find a good site for an IV, like they got nothing, then you need to put in an IO. So just ditch the IV. Don't dink around trying to find an IV if you can't get one in 60 to 90 seconds. Um, so then that's where the easy IO comes into play. And so that's just a gun. Um, you learn your landmarks in TNCC and you point and shoot. Okay. Um, we give them tons and tons of IV fluids wide open. Remember that if you're doing uh, an IO, you need to have a pressure bag on there because you have to overcome the pressure that's inside that uh, bone space. Um, also, if you are doing wide open fluids, you need to have them on a pressure bag or on a pump set at 999, okay? To get it in them really quickly, all right? Or you could possibly use a rapid infuser, a level one or a hotline, or there's a bunch of brands, and that will give a liter of fluid in over like two minutes. So they're very quick uh, that they get fluid in. All right. All right, now we're gonna follow on down and do our D, which is disability or neuro, okay? So you wanna get a good neuro assessment. This isn't our detailed one like we did with our stroke patients, um, but just a basic one. So we wanna look at uh, pupils, make sure that they're equal, they accommodate, they're round, they're reactive to light, okay? And then ask your LOC questions. So person, place, and time. Um, AVPU is just kind of a, a simplified GCS, and that just stands for awake, verbal, pain, or un unconscious. Um, GCS is much more detailed, so we need, need to get a GCS. Um, they need to possibly understand what the situation was, so how did they get in the accident? If they don't, then they're just a, um, alert and oriented times three, okay? So they might be missing some time in there, um, depending on if they lost consciousness or whatever. Um, then we want to do our grips and gas pedals, so you just have them uh, squeeze your hands, okay, and then push down with their feet on your hands, okay, and this we're just trying to establish, can they move all their extremities well, are they able to move their extremities, just basic, okay, so just grips and gas pedals. All right, now, expose an environment is our next thing, so we're going to strip them and flip them, cut off their clothes, 
um, if they haven't already had them cut off. So that's usually one of the first things that happens because your ER techs are really great and other nurses are really great about cutting off all their clothes if they're a trauma patient. Um, we're going to put some blankies on them. So now we made them naked, but now we got to put some blankies on them. And we uh, make, make sure we check our... Yes, are you done, little bird? Okay. Then we're going to make sure we check our uh, warming devices. So you can put a warming blanket on them, some sort of device to keep them warm. Um, the Arctic Sun or the uh, Bear Hugger, whatever you've got. And then take their temperature centrally. So we want to know if they're awake, get an oral or an axillary. Oral is preferable. If they're unconscious, you get a rectal. And then possibly, um, if, they, if you're putting a Foley in them, then you can get the central temp that way, continuously in their urine. Secondary assessment. So now we're going to do a full set of vitals and make sure we've got all our focused adjuncts taken care of. So this is where the provider will be at the bedside doing the FAST scan. And that's not our face, arms, speech thing from neuro. This is different. So this is a ultrasound that they're going to be doing at the bedside done by the provider in the ER. Um, they have to have it finished within five to 10 minutes. They're only looking for one thing. They're just looking for blood or fluid in the uh, abdomen. So in trauma patients, if they've got blood in their abdomen, it'll hide out in certain areas. And so they've just got to look in all those areas to find, to see if there's any blood. Um, so they'll just um, say, yes, it's positive for fluid or blood or no, it's negative. Um, and it stands for focused abdominal sonogram in a trauma. Okay. So that's that. And that has to be done from the time the patient's rolled in. So that's one of the first things the provider will be doing um, at the bedside. They'll be getting that fast scan. All right, we want x-rays and CTs, and these usually come as part of a trauma package or a preset order list um, that all the provider has to do is pick the trauma orders, and they'll order a bunch of stuff. You can add on the x-rays that are needed, okay? Based on deformity, pain, you know, um, patient complaint, that kind of thing. All right, now we want to get labs. We want to get a blood count. Are you done, little bird? Okay, we want to get a blood count because here we're trying to establish their H&H &H if they've lost blood or not. So a lot of injuries are significant enough that they're losing blood from somewhere, and so we need to establish that H&H. &H. A CMP, we're trying to look at their liver. Okay, We're also trying to look at their kidneys, uh, pre-renal, and um, we're also looking at basic electrolytes. So we're looking at our... Um, Liver enzymes, we're looking at our uh, creatinine and our GFR, okay? And then also looking to see basic electrolytes. All right, now our type and screen we absolutely need because if they're bleeding enough that we need to give them blood, we need another blood type and their antibody status. And then acidosis for, we can rule out with our ABG, okay? And then our uh, urine, that tells us how the kidneys are doing post-renal. And so if they're dumping a bunch of protein and blood, we need to know that. And so that's why we get check a urine. Now, um, they'll probably do a urine drug, um, and that checks for, depending on your facility, anywhere between 10 to 15 substances. Um, the only issue with that that you might run into is that uh, some insurance companies and some workman's comp cases won't pay for the uh, medical bills if it's determined that they were positive for something in their urine drug. So um, I would approach that with caution and, um, you know, just, you know, do as your provider orders. But just be aware of that, you know, kind of controversy that's present with that uh, test. All right. Now we're going to give comfort. And so positioning, pain meds, foot massage, back rub. So we're going to give comfort. We're going to do positioning or pain meds and a foot massage. Just kidding. No foot massage. Just positioning and pain meds. All right, now we're going to do our head-to-toe survey. So that's where we touch them from head-to-toe on the front, and then we flip them, and we do head-to-toe on the back. Um, and so this will probably, in all reality, be happening as soon as you finish your D. Then you'll be doing your head-to-toe detailed assessment because all the other stuff is happening in the background. Um, okay, so we're going to touch them from head-to-toe, and this is probably done in tandem with the provider so that they can start ordering things that are pertinent. Um, and so you're going to start with their head, and so you do their uh, zygomas, you're going to do uh, maxilla, right? And then you're going to check, uh, push on their nasal bone, check their mandible, both sides, 
And this is just done with one hand, right? Because if you're pushing on two sides, they may have an injury, but um, because you're pushing two places, it's hard for them to tell you where it hurts. So here, um, you know, and then all the way around, zygoma, both zygomas, front of their head, um, look in their ears. If there's blood in their ears, that's not great, um, but it could just be dripping down from a laceration. So you're going to want to have somebody come in and say, uh, you know, as you're finished, you know, continuing that head to toe assessment, you're going to ask someone, hey, can you come over here and uh, clean out their ears just, you know, on the outside, get rid of some of that blood. Tell me if it's dripping from the laceration that's on their head or if it's coming from their ears. All right. Um, then you're going to continue on down, you know, the back of the head, um, both sides, and then we go straight to their, um, you can slip your hand under and check a C-spine, okay, um, and you're just checking for vertebral point tenderness, and so, and then you're also checking to feel for possible step-off, which means that they've subluxed uh, their cervical spine, um, that they're not in line with each other anymore. All right, now, we're going to move in a, once we hit our chest, we're going to move in a straight down, straight down fashion. So you start at your clavicles, do one hand by itself or one hand on top of the other. Don't do two hands and don't do spidey fingers. Those don't work, right? So you're going to do one hand here on this clavicle, then move over to the other clavicle, and then you're just going to move across in a linear fashion, down a little bit, across, down a little bit. And you're asking the patient, does this feel, t is this, uh, am I producing any pain? Does this hurt? Okay. If the patient's not able to verbalize to you, so if they're unconscious, then we're feeling for crepitus. You were looking for ecchymosis. You're looking for obvious signs of injury. Um, you're also feeling for that subcutaneous emphysema, which means that there's free air in their subcutaneous um, in between. And so that feels like um, bubble wrap under their skin. It's a little, it's a little alarming. It's very strange. Okay. So then, this, the purpose of whole, this whole entire thing is that it reveals the other injuries that are being hidden by the distracting ones. So a really good example of a distracting injury is a broken arm or a broken leg. Um, the patient's screaming, you know, or um, a head wound or something. So they're screaming and they're saying that that's their only pain. But you can't really believe them because it has a, the brain, after you've had an accident, has a hard time registering multiple pain sites, um, especially right after the accident. And so we have to push on them everywhere. Because even if they say, this is my only thing that's hurting me is my broken arm, you can't take them at their word. Based on that mechanism of injury, if they're a trauma patient, you gotta do everything. Um, and so this will reveal other underlying injuries or possible life or limb threats that we didn't know about because we didn't take the time to push on them. Like I said earlier, um, everybody, all trauma patients have a possibility of having all the life or limb threats until otherwise ruled out or decided. Okay, so um, that's really important. All right, now somewhere in here we're going to get some sort of history from the family or from the patient, um, and this might be done in tandem with the provider or, um, you know, you guys might get information from each other. So signs and symptoms uh, that the patient's having, if they're able to tell you, um, allergies to medications, um, pertinent meds that they're on. The big one that you really want to ask about is anticoags. Okay, so any, any blood thinning medications, you're going to want to ask them about those because that's going to make their recovery and our ability to treat them a little bit more difficult. And so we want to know that if, if that's the case. Um, past medical history that's pertinent. So a really good example of something that's incredibly pertinent to their ability to uh, heal would be a clotting disorder, right? Um, if they're hemophilia, uh, something like that. And then also any other, any other major medical history. So COPD, CHF, um, you know, heart, lung, liver, kidney, any major medical problems, okay? Prior head injuries and the deficits they have left from those, things like that. Um, and then we want to know their, mat, their last solid and liquid. Well, why do we want that? Anesthesia wants that, right? Because most of these people are going to have to go to surgery to fix their injuries once they're identified. Um, a lot of the injuries are surgical. And so um, we need to know when the last time they ate solid food and when was the last time they ate liquids. Um, because anesthesia needs to know, right? Um, they need to be able to plan accordingly so that they can keep the patient at the least risk of aspiration during surgery. Now, does this mean that someone who had a hamburger right before they got in a car accident can't have surgery? No, 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 no. This just means that anesthesia needs to be made aware of it so that they can plan and be ready for it, okay? And then we want to know the events leading up to the trauma. 
So were it was it just a trauma or were they having a medical issue and then because they were engaging in some sort of um, you know motor vehicle or ATV or something motorcycle or whatever because of what they were um, the symptoms that they were having also caused the accident right or it might might have just been a straight accident with no medical cause mm -hmm. whatsoever so a good example of this is our diabetic patients who have hypoglycemia while they're operating a vehicle and then they go unconscious and then get in a car accident right so that patient is a medical patient, but they're also a trauma patient. So we'll need to treat the medical reason along with the trauma reason, um, along with all their trauma stuff too. So it's important to know the events leading up to the trauma so that we can rule out any sort of medical uh, causes of that accident. Um, so like our stroke patients, what if they decide to have symptoms of a stroke, heaven forbid, while they're driving a car? Well, then they get in a car accident and they're also having a stroke. So you have two things. You're treating traumatic injuries and you're also trying to fix the medical cause of the traumatic. So now we're going to talk about all the life or limb threats that we're trying to rule out with our primary and secondary assessment. Okay. So these are life or limb threats as differentiated by the body area. Okay. So in the head, we have skull fractures or brain bleeds. Okay. Those are two life or limb threats in the head. So if you have trauma to the head, those are two things that you got to worry about ruling out. Okay. Um, concussions are not a life or limb threat. That's the least of your worries. A concussion is very, um, is like a mild version of one of those, but if you don't have a brain bleed or a fracture, you're good. Concussion, um, you know, that's just, you got your bell rung, your brain rattled around a few times, but we need to make sure that's all it is. You need to make sure that they also don't have a brain bleed or a skull fracture uh, along with that, okay? All right, now in the neck, we've got C-spine fractures, right? Because we already learned that C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. So that's a major life or limb threat. In the chest, you've got tension pneumos, and we can see that with tracheal deviation and unequal breath sounds. Um, tamponade or cardiac tamponade um, with direct trauma to the chest. Uh, hemothorax or a pneumothorax, a flail chest. Flail chest happens if you have multiple rib fractures, either, um, so they have to be usually multiple fractures of multiple ribs. And so you can have um, two sides of one where you have a piece that's lifting up on its own, or you can have a whole entire side that's fractured all the way down, and then you have the rib cage kind of moving independently. And so you'll kind of see that weird, like seesaw -y kind of weird um, independent movement of the chest. Um, they also call it paradoxical. chest movement, um, and you'll see that. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, ruling out a dissecting aorta, because remember you have a major aorta in your chest. Um, this happens when you have a start and stop really quick, or a stop and start. So depending on how fast you were going, right, this is where the speed thing comes, comes into play. So if we have um, super fast uh, impact above, you know, 45 miles an hour, so let's pretend we're going down the freeway, 65, 75 miles an hour. Then we stop really um, quickly. And then because of the impact, our body stops, but the insides don't because of inertia and momentum. And so then the insides keep going, which means you have a shearing action that can happen in your um, aorta in your chest. Um, so this means that now you have blood that's moving in between the... Um, layers in the artery of the aorta, which isn't great. So then it's going there and it's not going to the rest of your body. Um, so people can usually bleed out from these within two to three minutes on scene. There isn't a whole lot that can be done for them, uh, but they can be uh, kind of a minor one and can be bleeding slowly. And so those can be ruled out later in the hospital, or um, those can be ruled out when they get to the hospital as well. Um, so we have a pulmonary contusion that can happen. Um, this might sound really benign, but it, it can actually be not benign. <laughs> so if you have a contusion, it means, you know, you have a bruise, but you have a contusion to your actual lung tissue. So not just a bruise on the outside, but a bruise on the inside of your lungs. Okay. Um, this leads to, um, edema, air swelling, all that kind of stuff. And so they can have respiratory distress, acute respiratory distress syndrome. They may be talking to you at the beginning. Um, but then this is something that has to be watched over 24 to 48 hours to make sure that they don't um, go into respiratory distress. All right, now, abdomen, we've got two things we've got to watch out for. We've got a liver on that side, and we've got a kidney on that side, okay? 
So we'll need to make sure that those are okay. We don't have a liver lack and we don't have an acute kidney, kidney uh, injury. The left side of our abdomen's got a few things we've got to worry about too. So we've got spleen lack on the left. Okay, you can bleed out fairly quickly depending on what the, the grade of that laceration is. Same with the liver. Um, we have a kidney on the left side and then we have to worry about diaphragmatic rupture if we have trauma to the left side of our body. So, but why? Why do we only need to worry about a diaphragmatic rupture if we have trauma to the left side? Well, that's because the right side has this big, huge liver bracing it and absorbing most of the impact. If you have trauma to the right side of your body, chances are you probably won't. There's an exception to every rule, but you probably won't rupture your diaphragm, okay? And then um, if we have trauma to the left, then you worry about a diaphragmatic rupture. So you'll hear bowel sounds in the chest cavity, right? And that's weird and very ominous, not great. You shouldn't really hear bowel sounds up here in the chest. And so when your diaphragm is ruptured, the bowel will come up into the chest and you'll hear, you'll, you will hear bowel sounds. All right, um, you have a dis dissecting aorta in the abdomen as well. So in the middle of our abdomen, we worry about dissecting down there too. Um, in the legs and arms, we have fat embolisms that happen with long bone fractures, um, compartment syndrome that happen in our lower extremities more often, but can also happen in the uppers. Um, so in compartment syndrome, you have a loss uh, because of the pressure. You have um, the arteries aren't able to um, beat anymore, right? And so then you lose a pulse in that extremity. Um, then they have extreme pain um, because the nerves have been compressed and then they also lose the color to that extremity as well. That's a pretty fast emergency thing that has to be taken care of uh, right then and there, okay? Um, and then we have long bone fractures. The bad thing with a long bone fracture is that um, you can lose, with, especially with femurs, you can lose at least a liter, if not two, depending on the size of the patient, of blood it, within like the first 10 minutes of that fracture. So um, that's something that needs to be made sure that it, it's ruled out uh, because that is a pretty good uh, life or limb threat. Um, so now with compartment syndrome, usually if it's going to happen, it'll happen within that first 24 to 48 hours of limb trauma. Okay. All right. That's the end.